Good evening. It is a real pleasure to be here tonight. Um, 20 years ago this summer, I actually be began my career in this very building working as an intern. Um, I had never really thought about museum work, but my mom said I had to get a job, so I got a job. But after a summer of digging through the collection and holding the same papers that Sam Houston had held and in my very own hands, too, I was hooked. So thank you, Dallas Historical Society, for starting me down this path. I also must thank Dealey Campbell. We first met as colleagues at sister institutions and quickly became friends. We've both roped each other into a lot of things over the years, and she's definitely the one that roped me into being here tonight. But like any good friend and colleague, she also assisted with some of the research for this presentation. Monday was actually her last day at the Historical Society, and I'll miss having her as my link to this organization. But I know that Dealey and I will continue to work together on all kinds of things, and Dallas Heritage Village and the Dallas Historical Society will also continue to partner. So I'm one of those people that never misses an election. Local, state, national, one of those really annoying runoffs where you only have one thing to vote for. I'm there, and I'm always disappointed when they run out of the I've voted stickers. When this photo first made the rounds during the 2016 election, I totally cried with all of the I've voted stickers on Susan B. Anthony's grave. But I wonder if I wasn't a student of women's history and African American history, I'm not sure if I would have cared quite so much. Generations of men and women fought and died for the right to vote. And this battle really wasn't all that long ago. So my grandmother was born in 1907, 13 years before the federal suffrage amendment passed. And I don't think she missed too many elections either, especially when she became one of the first women in the state of Texas appointed postmaster. But I'm not here tonight to talk about my own personal history, but rather our local history. What are the stories of the Dallas women who fought for our right to vote? How did their opinions change? And who should we be thanking today every time we go to the polls? So if you know anything about women's history and the women's suffrage movement, you probably know two dates. 1848, the date of the Seneca Falls Convention in New York, and 1920, which is the date the 19th Amendment passed. So as a matter of fact, the Seneca Falls Convention wasn't the first gathering that discussed women's rights, though it was certainly one of the earliest and definitely the one that got all the fame. Um, the women's rights grew directly out of the abolition movement, and many of the same people that were fighting for the rights of enslaved African Americans began to also question the rights of women. In fact, Frederick Douglass was there at Seneca Falls in 1848. Today, if we remember any names at all, it's most likely Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, but there were many, many others. This movement grew very slowly with organizations forming primarily in the more densely populated areas of the United States, so the East Coast. Um, the but as the nation expanded, these women also headed out to the frontiers. They, they went on speaking missions. They traveled all throughout the country um, speaking about the rights of women, trying to grow the movement. But they never quite made it to Texas. During the Civil War, these activist women shifted their focus to the current crisis. But when the war ended, the conversation about women's suffrage picked up again. At the same time, movement leaders began to shift that origin story of how things got going um, in an effort to align with the current mood of the country towards unification and reconciliation. The connection with abolition was de-emphasized and sometimes completely erased. The movement split for the first time, but not the last, over the 15th Amendment. Suffragists wanted the amendment to enfranchise both women and African Americans. Abolitionists didn't want to risk not having African Americans not having full citizenship rights. Oh, one ahead. Oh well. Here in Texas, there are attempts to get women's suffrage included in the 1868 Constitutional Convention and again in 1875. Both efforts failed. An organized suffrage organization didn't form in Texas until 1893. So why did it take so long? I'm sure with your own friends, you've gotten in the discussion before about whether Texas is more of a southern state or more of a western state, 
or maybe we're just our own thing. I'm on the, we're our own thing camp. Um, on the suffrage question though, we are decidedly Southern. In general, the suffrage movement was very slow to come to the South in part because of its origin being inextricably tied to African-American rights. Some Western states though were very quick to give women the vote. For example, Wyoming gave women the right to vote in 1869. In Texas, there were a lot of reasons to suppress the vote, including disenfranchising Hispanics. The women that most needed the right to vote didn't have the time to fight for it, and the women that had the time to fight for it were fully aware of the implications of allowing more people to vote. However, that 45-year gap doesn't mean that Texas women weren't fighting for their rights in other ways. Consider someone like our very own Sarah Horton Cockrell. So most of you have probably heard of Cockrell Hill, which is just south of here. She and her husband, Alexander Cockrell, came to Dallas County in 1847. In 1852, they moved to town because Alexander had just bought out John Neely Bryan for $7,000. The Cockrells now own most of Dallas. Once they got to Dallas, Alexander realized one of the big things hampering Dallas's growth was the lack of a bridge over the Trinity. You know, the Trinity River just keeps coming up over and over again. He formed the Dallas Bridge and, and Causeway Company, which also included a sawmill to build the bridge. Sarah kept the books and was somewhat involved in the management of the company because she was literate and her husband was not. This really came in handy in 1858 when Alexander was killed by City Marshal Andrew Moore. The circumstances were unclear and there was a trial later at which Moore was acquitted. There are many differing accounts, but one thing is known for sure. Moore owed Cockrell some money, and Cockrell was trying to collect that day. When Alexander died, he was building, running a brickyard, sawmill, building a hotel, running a ferry, and employed, you know, about half the town. They had four children, the oldest of whom was just eight. Sarah quickly assured her employees that the businesses would not close, even though, even though no one believed that a woman could actually manage all of those various business interests. And then she got to work. So the St. Nicholas Hotel opened in 1859. Um, a fire that destroyed most of downtown Dallas in 1860, of course, also hit the St. Nicholas. But she rebuilt, and she opened the Dallas Hotel. In 1860, she began work on an iron bridge over the Trinity, construction of which was slowed by the Civil War. Family legend claims that she traveled to Austin to lobby for approval of the bridge charter, making her the first woman to address the Texas legislature. Though that story can't be proven, Cockrell family friend Nicholas Darnell was Speaker of the House and probably had just a little bit of political influence to sway votes. Can't you just see her working behind the scenes to make it happen? It finally opened in 1872 at a cost of $65,000. Throughout the 1870s and 1880s, her business interests continued to grow. A flour mill, countless real estate deals, a residential subdivision, and office buildings. Bowing a bit to societal expectations, she rarely served on the boards of these biz companies, but left it to her son and her son-in-law. But do any of you believe that she took a back seat in these business deals? At her death in 1892, she owned approximately one quarter of downtown Dallas, several thousand acres in Dallas County, and other properties in Houston, Mineral Wells, and Cleburne. Sarah wasn't a suffragist, but I certainly believe her life helped pave the way for the rest of us. The suffrage movement really got going in Texas in 1893, just one year after Sarah's death. A few years before, two competing national suffrage organizations had merged to form the National American Woman Suffrage Association, or NASA. They sought to centralize operations and have member organizations in each state. On May 10, 1893, a group of interested parties gathered in Dallas to form the Texas Equal Rights Association. They also met to elect delegates to attend the World's Congress of Representative Women held in conjunction with the Chicago World's Fair. You gotta love World's Fairs, right? Especially at Fair Park. In an interview with the Dallas Morning News, organizer Rebecca Henry Hayes of Galveston said, but seriously, when I thought of holding this convention and began to reach out over the state with letters, the answers were so favorable, I commenced to think we would not have opposition enough, even for a fight. And that discouraged me, for I'm naturally combative. When asked about the other women joining her, she replied, 
Every one of them is a power in herself, cultured and talented and willing to give her time and means to the cause. We are not organizing for the fun of it. We are all women of middle age and know what we are about. They welcomed men to their cause and noted that Texas was one of the last Southern states to begin such an organization. The goal for the movement at the time was state suffrage, not a federal amendment. David McFadden was one of the few remaining survivors of the Battle of San Jacinto, and he sent a message through his granddaughter to that first meeting, her name was Alice McAnulty, in which he, quote, expressed his gratification that he had lived to see the day when women would also make a struggle for their freedom and liking it to the struggle of Texas for independence, wished them the same ultimate success. And he was named the first honorary member of the association. So I think that's kind of cool. During that first meeting, it appears that an argument developed over the role of religion in the women's movement. Mr. Copeland of the Texas Press Association, which also happened to be meeting at the same time in Texas and it appears maybe he crashed the party, um, made a speech where he urged the women to come become, quote, a little better educated, so they too could see the hollow shams of puny priests and humbug preachers, and then their occupations would be gone. He urged his heroes, hearers to cease teaching such silly rot to their children as the preachers prescribe and take the money they raise for supporting preachers and building fine churches and use it for educational purposes. So we all know how such statements would probably be received today. Can you imagine what the reaction to that statement would have been in 1893? Many people, at least according to the newspaper article, ironically, mostly men, agreed with him or argued with him, but this turn in the conversation likely impacted the growing movement, and Rebecca Hayes got her fight. Two weeks later, she wrote a letter to the Dallas Morning News stating point blank, the organization is non-sectarian. It has no war to wage on religion, church, or kindred societies. She also pleaded with the readers to only judge the organization by its official declarations. An additional defense was written by the recording secretary, Margaret Watson, and published on June 6th. Though the records are silent, I feel comfortable in assuming that this new organization got a flood of hate mail in those first few crucial weeks. That fall, about 300 women attended a Congress of Women during the State Fair. Large conventions during the State Fair continued in 1894 and 1895, but by 1896, the Texas Equal Rights Association had ceased to function. So a split over whether or not to invite Susan B. Anthony to speak in 1894 led to Rebecca Hayes being ousted from her office of president. The argument against Anthony echoes some of the reasons why Texans were hesitant to get involved in the suffrage movement in the first place. They felt that the South had to be treated differently when it came to women's suffrage. An upcoming national convention in Atlanta had everyone worried with some key leaders, including... Frederick Douglass, yes, he was still alive in 1894, um, refusing to travel to a segregated state. Rebecca Hayes argued, let all women and friends of the movement in the North delay the Southern Crusade until after the Atlanta Convention. So basically she's saying, hang on until we see how Atlanta goes, and then maybe we can keep moving forward. There they can meet the Southern ladies and obtain a true insight into the situation. Afterward, their visits to the South could be made with a full understanding of Southern character and Southern womanhood. Others were worried about whether the crowds would treat someone like Susan B. Anthony fairly, and ultimately they chose not to take the risk. Whether it was the new leadership, the split over, the, over inviting Anthony, or the fact that Rebecca Hayes was no longer in charge, the organization quietly faded away. During the surge of activism, several prominent women spoke out against suffrage. Some of you may be familiar with the name Mary Craig, who has a class after her, in her name that meets still today. In 1894, she wrote a lengthy editorial about her own opposition to suffrage. She wrote in part, My main opposition to woman's suffrage is that it will break up the home, the home upon which every institution of our land, church, state, all depend. One suffragist remarked that women's voting did not necessarily lead to results have proved to the contrary. Women in boarding houses are bad enough, but women in public office? This means worse ruin than Eve's loss of paradise. The need for women to be at home was a very con common anti-suffrage argument. 
Historians like to talk about separate spheres. Men were in the public sphere, doing business, making laws, and all those things that keep a society going. Women were in the private or domestic sphere, taking care of the home and children. They didn't need to venture into the public sphere since their husbands, fathers, and brothers would take care of everything. And, as the men argued, they actually had more power than them since they raised the children and provided a safe home for their men to return to. Craig also lifts up the primacy of the role of being a mother. She writes, quote, to be the mother of one successful man, if counted down the ages, would mean many more good votes than her individual ballot. I had no idea, did you? However, when the next evolution of the suffrage movement emerged in 1913, Mary Craig was a charter member of the Dallas Equal Suffrage Association. She had come to see the vote as the right response to changing times, especially for those women that were working in the public sphere. She had realized that not all women had the protection of men, and so therefore perhaps they needed the vote so they could take care of themselves. The Dallas Equal Suffrage Association formed in 1913, just before the first state suffrage convention in almost a decade. In just six weeks, almost 150 women joined. Their requirements for joining were rather broad. In a November article, they encouraged all women who are interested in the equal rights of the sexes are invited to join the association and become identified with the movement, whether they care to do active work in the movement or not. So I guess they just wanted their names? I don't know. They put them to work later, don't worry. So beyond membership, organizational efforts really focus on the State Fair of Texas. They made plans to host a booth throughout the entire run of the fair under the auspices of the Texas Equal Suffrage Association. They determined to make this a comfortable and inviting place for women visiting the exposition by furnishing it with a desk, chairs, and attractive conveniences. Free literature regarding the cause will be distributed every day, and souvenirs of the Dallas organization will be given away. The focus was clearly on charm, not necessarily politics. They also declared October 23rd as Equal Suffrage Day at the fair. More than 300 gathered to hear speeches by Mrs. W.E. Spell of Waco, Vice President of the Texas Equal Suffrage Association, and she's in one of the pictures that's in the exhibit, as well as other suffragist leaders, including Ms. Kate Gordon of New Orleans. Using the fair as a prime opportunity, both to reach potential new supporters as well as connect with suffragists throughout the state, their work continued. They basically had a big conference every year during the state fair where all the women involved in the movement could get together along with all of that outreach work. In 1915, they used the coincidence of Equal Suffrage Day as also being Traveling Man's Day or Salesman Day. Um, and vowed to get an equal suffrage badge on every salesman attending. Later, the Dallas Times Herald reported that with a diplomacy that would make England's cabinet sick with envy and getting a votes for women badge on every traveling salesman, the highways and byways are golden with the admonition of the cause. The other funny thing is one of these big days for the State Fair was also Texas OU Day. And I was just trying to imagine like the Texas OU crowd and the suffragists together at the State Fair. I'm not sure how that went. The paper did not mention that. And maybe the Texas OU crowd was nicer in 1914. I don't know. As great of an opportunity as the State Fair provided, the greatest opportunity for the suffragist cause came with the United States' entry into World War I in 1917. Unlike previous wars, women during World War I were more active and directly involved in the war effort. Large marketing campaigns quickly began to encourage women to practice economy at home, as well as get involved in various fundraising efforts and bond campaigns. However, this inclusion was still limited to what women often did at home or in her existing social circle. For many Dallas women, their war, war work was centered in their club work. When the war broke out, these clubs quickly and easily shifted into war work. Many of these groups consolidated their efforts in order to be most efficient, forming the National League of Women's Service. They, and later the City Federation of Women's Clubs, combined to educate women about food conservation, register women's skills for possible war work, and sell war bonds. Women were already connected in a way they hadn't been before through those clubs, which enabled them to move quickly once war was declared. Their involvement in World War I was unprecedented, but it would not have been possible without that existing network of clubs. 
One of the greatest accomplishments by club women was made by the Dallas Federation of Women's Clubs with their efforts at running a canteen for sol soldiers passing through Dallas. In January 1918, H.A. Olmsted, chair of the Dallas Council of Defense, pledged support from Dallas businessmen if they, the women, were willing to take charge of this canteen. He stated that such a canteen would be a big advertisement for Dallas. The soldiers would write to their various homes and tell the hospitality of the Dallas women. You know, our city, we're always trying, trying to sell ourselves to others, right? The Federation would receive no assistance from the state, but would have to raise all of the operational funds. So they got to work immediately with various clubs planning fundraisers or pledging money. By the end of February, rent money for two months had been pledged, as well as $250 towards furniture. These women believe that, quote, it is our responsibility to help safeguard the morals of the men in uniform who come to our city. Club meetings throughout the city reported increased attendance due to war work, especially the, campaign, the canteen, and it opened in March 1918. Staffed by volunteers from 27 women's clubs, which for those of you that have done any club work, can you imagine trying to organize 27 women's clubs? Uh, they promised that, quote, everything will be done to make the soldiers feel that the canteen is a place to be sought out whenever they are in town. Activities included food, reading material, stationery to write letters home, and an eight-piece orchestra, which performed nightly for supervised dancing. In just three months, they served over 10,000 men. Just before the canteen opened, there was a really big debate as to what this canteen would be named. Many wanted to just call it the Dallas Canteen, but the club women involved wanted the canteen to immediately be identified with their work and their efforts. Quote, while we are glad to have non-federated clubs and individuals who are interested and wish to do so, do so. It is the work of the Federation and the name of the canteen should suggest that it is conducted under the auspices of the city Federation. These women wanted full credit for their work. In newspaper articles, the canteen was referred to as the recreational campaign under the auspices of the City Federation of Women's Clubs. And now you can all say that three times fast. By early summer, the canteen was deemed a howling success. But in July, the Dallas War Camp Community Service took over management of the canteen because they were unable to give support money to outside organizations, and the canteen was costing a lot more than the Federation had planned for. However, these club women were optimistic in passing the torch. One of the organizers deemed it quite a compliment that the War Camp Community Service wanted to take the canteen over, that it was the biggest feather in our Federation's cap, and she was highly gratified. The Federation, of course, continued their volunteer work with the campaign, but were no longer responsible for the finances. So, in a talk about women's suffrage, why am I talking about World War I and the canteen? As mentioned pre previously, there was a lot of overlap between club women and suffragists. And at the same time that they were engaged in the monumental task of fundraising and opening this canteen, they were also gathering signatures and fighting to get the right to vote in Texas primary elections. March 1918 was an absolutely pivotal month for the women in Dallas, as well as the state. By the end of the month, the canteen had opened, and women had the right to vote in Texas primaries. Can you imagine the swirl of emotions they must have felt? I think exhaustion probably would have been there, elation, and satisfaction. In the midst of increasing war work throughout the country, Minnie Fisher Cunningham, who is president of the State Suffrage Association, she's from Houston, saw a really unique opening in state politics. Six months before, the suffragists had worked with others to have Governor Jim Ferguson impeached. Ferguson was staunchly anti-suffrage, and they knew that he would likely veto any bill that passed the legislature. So with mounting charges of corruption against Ferguson, Cunningham saw an opportunity to, quote, break the power of corrupt politics in Texas. When it began to look as if their efforts would be successful, she wrote to Carrie Chapman Catt, leader of the National Suffrage Movement, for advice. After we get impeachment, the lieutenant governor will call a special session of the legislature. It seems to me a wonderfully opportune moment to ask them to put through our primary suffrage bill. What do you think? Would you advise it? The new governor, W.P. Hobby, was in favor of suffrage, and they decided to begin an advocacy campaign for the March 1918 special session. 
Because Texas was essentially a one-party state at the time, the ability to vote in the primaries was almost the equivalent of full state suffrage. Their tactic also relied on modern technology. I love this detail. They sent a telegram every 15 minutes to state senators signed by various prominent local residents. They were also able to capitalize on the disgust many felt at the cha charges against the impeached, government, impeached governor. In September 1917, Cunningham had written to Katz, so six months before they launched this campaign, it has been full six weeks since I have found any man with the temerity to look us in the eye and say he opposed women's voting in the face of the outrageous condition that has been proven to prevail in our state government. The time was also ripe in Dallas for this activity. Between war work and the momentum of the suffrage movement, attendance was growing rapidly in many women's organizations. On March 5th, the minutes of the City Federation of Women's Clubs reported, with new aims and interests, the club work is more vital and important than it has ever been before, and as a result, the attendance has increased to such an extent that it has become necessary to seek larger accommodations. That same day, an article in the Dallas Morning News announced that the Dallas Equal Suffrage Association was beginning a petition for support of any legislation promoting women's suffrage. State legislator Barry Miller told the group that he would change his mind and vote for women's suffrage if they could gather 5,000 women in his district to sign the petition. So as a longtime staff member at Dallas Heritage Village, I definitely know the name Barry Miller and that he was active in state politics. But I will confess that I had never really thought about what he actually did as a state legislature, legislator. To give a little background on Barry, he married Minnie Miller, who is the youngest daughter of William Brown Miller. And yes, it is very confusing and awkward that a Miller married a Miller. They were not cousins. Um, many of you, of course, are familiar with their home, Millermore, which today is a signature building at Dallas Heritage Village. Minnie was part of the first Idlewild debutantes in 1884 and married her escort, Barry Miller, just a few years later. When her parents died in 1899, she and her family moved back to Millermore. She ran the farm while Barry drove the five miles into town to continue his law practice. Evelyn, their youngest child, wrote a sketch about her parents sharing the following about her father's political career. Papa became increasingly active in politics. Most often he campaigned for friends or causes in which he believed, but occasionally for himself. He served in the Texas State Senate from 1899 to 1901, received a gubernatorial appointment to a district ju judgeship in Dallas in 1911, and served in the Texas House of Representatives in 1917 through 1922, and as Lieutenant Governor of Texas in 1925 and 1930. Clearly, I should have been paying more attention to Barry. At first, Mama hated, and hated is in all caps, politics, and never came to like having her husband a candidate. Among his early political accomplishments was authoring the legislation that made the blue bonnet the state flower of Texas in 1901. Is that not cool? Apparently, the wife of the lawyer that he apprenticed with when he first came to Texas, it was her favorite flower, and so he did it to honor her, which is also very lovely and charming. So Barry Miller definitely did not change his opinion through conversations he had at home. Evelyn writes, Mama had not, and again, not is in all caps, wanted the vote. But when she got it, she took it very seriously. The Dallas Equal Suffrage Association used recent war work efforts as an opening. Club women in Dallas were raising funds for the Women's Overseas Hospital Unit, and Barry Miller had contributed. Quote, Dallas suffragists take this as a hopeful sign and hope that Judge Miller may yet be counted among the friends of equal suffrage. So they went and had a meeting with him, and Judge Miller, ever the politician, set before the suffragists a challenge to gather 5,000 signatures that there was currently no legislation pending at the state legislature, at the, at the state. Two days later, the news reported that 1,000 names had already been collected. Those signatures are necessary, said Mrs. Noni B. Mahoney, Vice President of the Equal Suffrage Association, in order to persuade one man, Barry Miller, that there is a silent sentiment in favor of suffrage in Dallas County. We are going to win. There is no chance for us to fail. In addition to can canvassing the women in their immediate circles, they also made a special effort to reach out to working women, visiting such local businesses as Sanger Brothers, Neiman Marcus, Butler Brothers, Brown Cracker and Candy Company, and the Wilson Building. In a March 9th article announcing that they expected to go over the 5,000 mark that day, Mrs. Mahoney stated, 
The interest in this petition is not confined to any one class. The women of Highland Park and the mill districts are equally interested and equally anxious to sign. Anecdotes about the signing efforts include a mother who had five daughters working in the factories who believed that their working conditions would improve with suffrage. Another woman, age 70, bought in, brought in a petition with over 200 signatures and then apologized. I would have got a good many more, but I happened upon so many of my old friends that I just had to stop and chat with them for a while. We've never had that problem, right? By March 10th, they had reached 8,000 signatures. And that's when she headed to Austin with a suitcase full of the petitions to present to Barry Miller. Upon their success, Mrs. Mahoney declared, the suffragists of Texas welcomed the support of Mr. Miller. The suffragists accepted Barry Miller's challenge and shown what they are capable of doing, but they refused to accept any more such challenges to unproductive labor. They cannot spare any more time from war work. Remember, at the same time that they're gathering thousands of signatures from all over Dallas, they are also trying to open a canteen to serve traveling soldiers. And that link between club work, war work, and suffrage work was deep and powerful. And it was a link that was often acknowledged during this time period. This isn't one of those cases where historians are looking back and go, oh, look how this is all connected. Um, a few years before, Pauline Periwinkle, well-known club woman and Dallas Morning News journalist, wrote, women's clubs everywhere have crossed the Rubicon dividing self-seeking from the world's work. It would be hard to find a band of women nowadays content solely with filling up on literary pablum, whether represented by hardtack or syllabub, the classics or current fiction. Nowadays, when women meet and ask, what is your club doing? The answer expected is not, we're studying French history and literature, but we're establishing free kindergartens, or we're working for civic improvement, etc. Even in states southernmost in feelings and sentiment snaps its fingers at ge geographical lines, it is no longer considered unwomanly for women to take a good-sized dish in municipal affairs. On March 15th, just a few days after Mrs. Mahoney delivered 10,000 signatures to Barry Miller, so they got twice what they needed in a week. Um, the House voted 84 to 34 to give women the right to vote in primary elections. Because the timing of the vote was a bit of a surprise, only a few suffragists, including our old friend Minnie Fisher Cunningham, were in attendance. Though there was some debate, no one really doubted that it would pass. A few argued that they should wait for a federal amendment so that the question could be taken to the people. But as Representative Canales said, if the women are so anxious to have this right that they would rather have a half measure than a full measure, let them have it and let them take the full responsibility for the same. Within a week, the bill passed the Senate with a few amendments, went back to the House, and was signed into law on March 26, 1918. In a letter to Carrie Chapman Catt, Minnie Fisher Cunningham wrote, when the final vote was taken, we rose to leave the gallery of the House, and when the men saw us, they all stood up and gave us a perfect ovation, cheering for some minutes and calling for a speech. It was a surprising and greatly appreciated tribute to the work that the women have been doing. But there was no time for rest or celebration. The war was still on, and now these newly enfranchised women had to register to vote. As Mrs. Jelanik, president of the Dallas Equal Suffrage Association, said to the news, the members are too heavily engaged in war work to stop for a celebration. We are too occupied with helping the Red Cross and promoting the gardening campaign to take time for a public jubilee, and we think it would be unpatriotic to cease this important work to rejoice over something that benefits ourselves merely. With a primary election looming on July 27th, there was only a 17-day registration window, and yet 386,000 women from across the state of Texas registered. There were some counties where more women were registered than men, which I think that's kind of amazing, too. Dallas suffragists declared themselves unconcerned with getting their fellow women to register after the success of the petition drive just a few weeks before. They set up a committee to call everyone that signed the petition, and when it came time to register, booths were set up in key department stores as well as the courthouse. They also began actively campaigning, both for Governor Hobby, who of course supported suffrage, as well as Annie Webb Blanton, who was running for the state superintendent of public instruction. She ended up becoming the first woman elected to a statewide office in Texas. As part of Blanton's campaign, she visited the Dallas Federation of Women's Clubs in early June, and her visit sparked a reinterpretation of the club constitution. 
There was a rule already that allowed clubs to participate in politics as one unit, but no provision allowing campaigns to seek support from individuals through those clubs. As the minutes pointed out, since women are becoming political factors by their enfranchisement, it is necessary to deal with political questions. These clubs have been active politically for years, and yet the vote opened new doors for the clubs and its members. The clubs themselves responded in a variety of ways. The Texas Federation of Women's Clubs created a political science committee as early as 1912. In 1914, there was a strong push at the state level for all of the delegate member clubs to begin a civil service reform committee. Mrs. Avril, in her speech, urged the delegates to do this immediately and let this be a body alert for opportunities and emergencies. You cannot turn in any direction to try and better things without becoming linked with government. With primary suffrage secure, the women's clubs turned to the work of educating their members about their new rights and working towards the pas passage of the federal suffrage amendment. In 1919, the legislative committee to the, in the Dallas Federation became more active. A request was even sent out for volunteers to phone certified voters and car owners to give their service and their cars. Throughout the country, these same club women also became intense letter writing campaigns to their representatives in Washington for the federal suffrage amendment. In what should be no surprise, local efforts mirrored efforts at the national level. A major suffrage parade in Washington, D.C. in 1913, and remember, the Dallas Equal Suffrage Association got going again in 1913, so that's an important year, um, signaled the beginning of that final push for suffrage. Carrie Chapman Catt became the leader of the National American Woman Suffrage Association in 1915. She centralized the organization and focused efforts on the federal amendment, which had first been proposed back in 1878. Disagreements over tactics led to yet another split in the movement. Alice Paul favored a more aggressive approach and formed the National Women's Party in 1916. While Catt believed that efforts to secure the vote should be suspended in light of World War I, Paul instead began staging protests at the White House in 1917. These protesters were beaten, arrested, and went on hunger strikes while in jail. At the same time, they brought enormous publicity to the cause, and many people were deeply conflicted about these protests. Joseph Weldon Bailey, the Texas senator from 1901 to 1913, was well known for being opposed to suffrage. He was very loud about it. He believed that the amendment limits the power of women's suffrage exactly as the 15th Amendment limited the power of the states with respect to Negro suffrage, and that amendment was denounced by all Democrats as an invasion of state rights. So it's that old Southern argument of state rights. After he lost his Senate seat, he continued to practice law in D.C., when a friend's daughter was arrested for protesting, Bailey quickly offered his assistance. As he wrote, I am, as you know, strongly opposed to women's suffrage, but I am still more strongly opposed to oppression in every form, and I know the history of the world well enough to know that when the officers of the law deliberately deprive people of their rights because those rights do not happen to be exercised in a way to please the officers, we are reaching the end of a free government. Yeah, it seems timely, doesn't it? Those that are familiar with the history of the suffrage movement will recognize the last name of the worried father, Milholland. Inez Milholland was an active member of the National Women's Party and led the 1913 march on horseback. She died in 1916 while on a speaking tour for suffrage, but her little sister, Vida, carried on and was in jail for three days in 1917. At the 1918 State of the Union Address, President Woodrow Wilson came out in favor of the suffrage amendment. During a special session of Congress in 1919, the proposed amendment passed the House and Senate and headed to the states for ratification. Texas was the ninth state to ratify and the first southern state to do so. In Texas, the amendment passed fairly easily despite some recent losses. In May 1919, a state constitutional amendment had failed in a popular vote. The proposed amendment had two provisions. One, would, it's one, so one thing they're voting on, but two very different things that are in there. One would allow women to vote, and one would disenfranchise resident aliens. And again, very prominent, like, you know, timely topic. Ironically, since this was a special election and not a primary election, women could not vote. Illegal aliens who could currently vote stood to lose the ballot if the measure passed, voted. So the suffragists knew that it failed for many reasons, including a short campaign season and, of course, that linkage to immigrant rights. 
But our suffragist friends carried on. After this loss, they immediately turned their attention to the federal amendment. In a letter to Carrie Chapman Catt, Minnie Fisher Cunningham wrote, it was a hot battle with the advantage on our side from the start because we went to work the day after we knew we had lost our referendum, whereas the antis were too busy counting up a great big majority against us so we couldn't contest the election and expose our cheating. In a June 12, 1919 article, our old friend Barry Miller is quoted as saying, I do not expect any great opposition to the ratification of the suffrage amendment. He had become increasingly involved in the movement, including serving as chairman of the Men's League of the Dallas Equal Suffrage Association. So talk about a shift. Um, he presided over multiple meetings and rallies in the spring of 1919. There's all these stories of him traveling all over North Texas giving speeches in favor of suffrage. Um, when it came up to vote in late June, Miller successfully stopped two attempts to force the issue to a popular vote, and the amendment passed the Senate and was ratified on June 28, 1919. As Cunningham wrote to Kat, I lived a million years while they were voting. This time, the suffragists planned a party, though they decided to wait until the legislators returned to Dallas so they could join in the fun. So Tennessee was the final state to ratify the 19th Amendment on August 18, 1920. Governor Hobby issued a declaration a few days later highlighting Texas's passage of the primary law in 1918 and being the first southern state to pass the 19th Amendment. And in typical Texas, you know, we're always the best, right? He also wrote... It is but just, therefore, to claim to, for Texas the credit for leading the way and making it possible for 17 million women to vote in the general election of 1920. Furthermore, he declared September 4th as a holiday to honor the indomitable spirit of American womanhood. But the Dallas suffragists weren't interested in celebration. Keeping their eye on the work, Mrs. Mahoney declared that there would be no special celebration in Dallas that day. She told the news. I am sure the women of Dallas and of Texas regard the victory of last Saturday over former Senator Joe Bailey, remember Joe, in the race for governor as the greatest celebration possible at this time. I love that little, it's like they're driving a knife in. And so far, as I know, there is being planned nothing to take its place, since Mr. Bailey has long been regarded as one of the principal opponents of women's suffrage by his taking fees and cases against the cause, the women of the state consider it their victory over him. That statement is a pretty clear indication that these women have certainly learned how to play the political game. Today, we live in a world where it's sometimes hard to be optimistic about our political system. No matter the current situation, I've always taken great comfort in history. Corruption, double dealing, self-interest, bribery, and lies, it's always been a part of our political system. But we've also always had people that have fought for the rights of others. As we get ready for another election cycle, one that I'm sure will be vicious and contentious, remember these ladies and men who fought for your right to vote. So now let us applaud people like Minnie Fisher Cunningham Isidore Calloway, a.k.a. Pauline Periwinkle, Barry Miller, Noni Mahoney, Mary Craig, and also let us applaud ourselves for caring about these stories in the first place. Thank you. So I think we have time for questions, if anybody has. Yes, sir. Women accompanied are able to go to this part. Men can go to this part. Unaccompanied women can't go. Right. That was one. The other one was um, I read a lot that the temperance movement because you know women were home while their men were out getting drunk, and then they couldn't get a job and they'd be starving. Right. That the temperance movement was, was tightly. Yes. Yes, and that it not as so. My and I am. I mean. I'm up here as an expert, but I'm not an expert. Um, the temperance movement, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was very closely connected with the suffrage movement, but a lot of that was earlier, so like in the 1870s and 1880s. So keep in mind, Texas was not super active with the suffrage stuff until the 1890s. So by then, again, I said there were splits. 
there were many splits, and one of the splits was between the Women's Christian Temperance Union and they had they kept having disagreements about do we go for state rights first? Do we go for a federal amendment first? Or is our goal getting the vote? Is our goal equal rights for all? They kept having, so the, the movement itself, part of the reason why it took so long is it kept doing one of these things. So yes, they were very closely linked. In my reading of what was happening in Texas, the leaders of the temperance movement did not really come up much. That, I think that was more of a slightly earlier East Coast, Ohio, you know, the more settled areas. So, yes, sir. Three quick, three quick, okay. I did not discuss that with my grandparents. My parents are here. Um, I did not discuss, my grandmother died, the grandmother was, that was in there died when I was 13. And so I did not really, you know, when you're 13, you don't ask those questions. Um, other sources included the minutes of the Women's Federation of Women's Clubs, which is um, held at the Dallas Public Library. Um, the letter from Joseph Bailey is actually here in this collection. Um, at the Dallas Historical Society. The other beautiful thing is many Fisher Cunningham's letters have been digitized by the University of Houston, and it is a beautifully, it was one of those when I found it, I'm like, oh my God, this is the most gorgeous digitization project I've ever seen. Um, and there's some other books that have collected primary sources in one. So there's a great book that was done years ago called Citizens at Last that is kind of a collection of all kinds of primary source suffrage documents. So. I did get back into the archives. I've not done research. When you're the director of a museum, you don't usually get a lot of time to do research. And it had been a while since I'd done it, so it's kind of exciting. Um, I'm not working on anything formal. I may do a version of this focusing on March 1918 for the Legacies Conference in January. Um, so I think, did I get all of your questions? Yes. <laughs> How am I? I? I might have missed some, any comments you want to make about it. I heard in the March, I think it was in D.C., that very ironically they wouldn't let African Americans in the Museum of Science and Technology because they were afraid that they would be seen as a threat. Right, right. Well, and they were also like throwing themselves under racetracks. You know, they were very militant in England, too. If you thought, right, 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 right. <laughs> yes. Right. Margaret Bell Houston Kaufman. I think that's all of her names, was very active in the Dallas group and was part of the founding um, charter officers and all that kind of stuff. And she, I wish I could have found more information out about her because she looks like a very interesting person. She was also a novelist. Um, and of course, there's the Sam Houston connection. Who doesn't like a good Sam Houston connection? So yes, yeah, she was very active. She just, her name just didn't make it um, into the paper, but she seems like a really amazing person. Um, the African-American stuff is hard because, again, you know, the movement was initially coming out of the abolition movement and, you know, with the Civil War and then the end of the Civil War, the focus was trying to not upset the South any more than they were already upset. And so because of that, and again, this was another schism in the movement, um, the leaders at the time decide we're just not going to worry about African-American women. And that is not to say that African-American women were not fighting for the right to vote also, but the main organizations were just ignoring that. And again, you know, you've got the 1890s is when the Jim Crow laws really got going as well. So that's when the, the 15th Amendment kind of came invalid for a large portion of the South because of all the different restrictions placed on voting. So it's a it's a complicated time and I'm sure they 
there are women in that group that believe that if we, if we focus on white women rights, eventually we'll get to African American rights. But of course, African Americans didn't want to wait, and I don't blame them. So it is a very complicated um, thing. And again, I, I know there were there had to have been African American women fighting for the right to vote in Texas. I have not found their stories yet. And there may be others that have had more time to delve into this, but those are often hidden histories that really take a lot of, of, of pulling. So did I answer everything? Right. And uh, you know, there's a great map in the pop-up exhibit that shows what what the U.S. looked like for voting rights for women in 1918. And you can see that there are different states to different things. So some states you could only vote in presidential elections, and that was it. In some states you could only vote in local and school elections. And, you know, again, Texas, you know, the irony for Texas is that when, when the state constitutional amendment was up, women couldn't vote even though they had the right to vote because it was a special election and not a primary election. So again, there's, and we see this today, all of the different permutations of ways to stop people from voting. And it is, it is a thing that continues. And yes, our voter turnout is not good, especially for local elections. I mean, it's, it's horrifying what our local election turnout is. And at the same time, you know, the voter ID laws and the having to carry two IDs, those are all different versions of things that we have been doing ever since the 15th Amendment in the 1860s. Oh, oh, all the hands. Christy. I do not. I'm not that good. You, you, use Google. <laughs> Google instead of Melissa. Uh, back in the back. I didn't find anything out about that. Um, one of the things that was emphasized in some of the other work that's been done on the women's suffrage movement in Dallas is that we did it in a very conservative manner. So these were club women that were established society ladies doing this work. So I have a feeling there, but I also know, but again, I don't have many details. There were like 13 suffrage associations in Dallas. And so they clearly didn't all join the Dallas Equal Suffrage Association. That was the biggest, and that was the one that threw all the big events. So there may have been some of that in some of those smaller ones, but again, I've, I've not found much about that, you know, and those society ladies probably didn't hang out with the socialists. I'm just guessing. Their husbands probably would not have liked that as the capitalist. Yes? When you spoke about the uh, Texas statute, which gave women the right to vote in primary mm -hmm. elections, were you using the word primary in the contemporary sense as uh, party primary? Yes, party, party primaries. And at that point... Does that mean to the exclusion of the general election? Yes. Okay. But Texas was basically a one-party state, so whoever won the primary was going to win the general election. So they thought that was a good first step and enough for Texas to really get, you know, what they wanted. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, most states in the South had a poll tax. Right, most states in the South. And it depends on which state in the South on what the rules were to vote. So, like, for example, in North Carolina, where I went to grad school, they had a grandfather clause. So if your grandfather was free, you could vote. And um, I spent a summer as an intern in North Carolina at um, a house that was owned by an African-American doctor who actually had run for mayor of Raleigh in 1919 on an all African-American ticket. And his grandfather was free. And so they found, it was one of those fabulous every historian's dream where nobody, it was single family owned the home and they never threw anything away. And so as they were going through stuff, they found 
um, Dr. Pope's grandfather's Freedman papers, as well as his voter registration card. And as far as we know, that's one of the few voter registration cards held that survived held by an African-American. So it depends on the state, on what permutation they did, but grandfather clause, poll tax, literacy tests where you'd be asked to do things like recite the entire constitution, which I can't do that, nor do I have any desire to do that. Um, spelling tests where it'd be these ridiculously long words. So it just depended on the state on what they did, and that really started in the 1890s. Because remember, in the 1870s and 1880s, there were quite a few African Americans that were elected to political office in the South. And what was happening politically was these working class people were starting to get together and do things. And, and some other people didn't like that, so. It applied to everybody, but that, but it was a, it was, and it was an amount that would not be a big deal for a white, wealthy male to pay, but would be a very big deal for anyone that was poor to pay. So, it did apply to everybody. You had your hand up earlier. Yeah, um, so it closed the Women's Museum, that, that she saw the Women's Museum and she was very excited and, and it's not there anymore. So yes, the Women's Museum did close. So I was an intern at the Women's Museum the summer um, that it opened, which was the summer of 2000? I'm sorry, I'm looking at my mother and she's like, don't look at me. I think it was the summer of 2000. And it was open for about 10 years. So, um, I could say things off mic about that. Um, but yeah, it, it struggled to find an audience. Um, and they, they also had made some, unf the, the overhead, running a museum is really hard and really expensive. And they had not done a great job with their business plan. So um, the, the, the easiest thing to explain part of why they were not able to survive is um, they, like the D Dallas Historical Society, like Dallas Heritage Village, are in a management agreement with the city of Dallas to manage these properties that are owned by the city. And um, you negotiate that management agreement, and they did not listen to the advice of some of their colleagues. And the city of Dallas pays the utilities for most of us, but did not pay the utilities for the Women's Museum. And so it's a giant open atrium, and I can't even begin to imagine what it costs to heat and cool that space. And so they went back to the city after a couple of years of basically drowning in their utility bills um, and said, help, we found out that everybody else, nobody else in Fair Park has to pay their utilities. And the city said, you've got that agreement, that's the agreement. So really that, it was really hard I mean, starting in a museum is hard no matter what, but when you've got that kind of, and, and not having planned for that, I mean, they, they designed the space not thinking about utilities. I'm very grateful the city pays our utilities because we have a lot of drafty wooden buildings. Yes. So the Women's Museum was a non-collecting institution. So almost everything that they had was borrowed from other museums. So in that case, it was fairly easy to dissolve. They had a, a small collection, and I'm not sure exactly what happened to that, but the vast majority of the artifacts were on loan. My, my internship was processing those loans, those incoming loans. So almost everything in there was on loan. So that makes it easier. Yes, Christy. <laughs> okay. Of the entire state? Okay. So I I feel like three hundred eighty six thousand and seventeen days is like good no matter what the population of the state is, because that is not a lot of time and that is a lot of like signatures. Huh? 
A lot of work, a lot of work. And again, the fact that they got 10,000 signatures in less than a week at a time where like transportation was not quite as speedy. But yeah, they hung out at Singer Brothers and <laughs> chatted with people, which I also think is brilliant. And you know, go, go to the people where they are. Yes? I did not do that. I didn't go much past 1920. I'm hearing the 60s. Okay. Well, all right. Any, any, thank you so much for coming. And since, and, and since I have the mic and I represent another institution in the city, I can tell you that we have a few upcoming events also. Um, on Saturday, we are doing a new concept of um, program. We're calling it Parlor Talks, and we're actually going to be in the parlor of Millermore, so a more casual, not someone at a, at a podium talking about um, two of our favorite books that happen to be celebrating really big birthdays this month. So Little Women was published 150 years ago, and Anna Green Gables was published 110 years ago, both in June of their respective years. So myself and our curator are going to be in conversation about these books. Um, spoiler alert, Anna Green Gables is my favorite book, and it is not my curator's. So there may be a discussion. Um, so anyway, so that's on Saturday at 2 at Dallas Heritage Village. On Tuesday from 5 to 8, we've got a nonprofit night across the street at Craft and Growler. And we're going to have some Dallas quizzing opportunities. So see what you know about Dallas stuff. And then um, Old Fashioned Fourth is on July 4th. It's a great way to wear out your children so they can take a good long nap and then make it through the fireworks. Um, and then after that, we kind of go into hibernation for a while because we are a mostly outdoor museum and it's really hot in Texas. But we would love to see you anytime. So thank you very much. <laughs>